The Gene Oceans, the insectoid architects of the CIS droid army, played a huge role in the Clone Wars. They were largely responsible for making the Confederacy such a major threat to the Republic, and it was their homeworld that served as the first battlefield of the war. But despite this, many Star Wars fans don't really know all that much about the Gene Oceans, in particular how terrifying they were. You may be familiar with their weapon making, their brainworms, and their zombie cast, but those were just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these ferocious beings. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Gene Oceans and talking about why they were much scarier than many fans give them credit for. Attention, Sergeant on deck! The Gene Oceans were a semi insectoid species notable for their chitinous exoskeletons, their warriors' leathery wings, their strength, and above all, their ingenuity. Their evolution had been greatly influenced by a cataclysm in their rocky homeworld's distant past. Long ago, a comet had struck Geonosis' largest moon, shattering it and forming the planet's distinctive ring system. The cataclysm had pummeled Geonosis with rocks, turning most of the planet to a desert. To make matters worse, the cataclysm weakened the protective layers of the Geonosian atmosphere, making the planet less insulated against solar radiation. Virtually all the native species of Geonosis were wiped out between the asteroid showers and the radiation storms. But as fate would have it, the cataclysm ended up being the Geonosians' ticket to the top of their planet's food chain. Their exoskeletons made them resistant to the planet's radiation storms, and because they built the vital parts of their hives deep underground, they were largely insulated from the rock showers as well. While their competitor species perished, the Gene Oceans thrived living off funguses they grew in the lowest tunnels of their hives. They multiplied rapidly so that by the time of the Clone Wars, Geonosis had a total population of 100 billion, despite their queen-centric breeding habits and violent culture. The Gene Oceans were divided into biologically distinct castes, each of which had their own roles in Gene Ocean society. The lowest of these classes was the Lesser Caste, a force of worker drones that served as laborers, servants, farmers, and builders. The worker drones were virtually enslaved. They were only allowed to leave work to sleep, and they were routinely worked to death or killed in mechanical accidents in the factories. When workers weren't needed, they were often put into suspended animation to leave more food for the gene oceans of higher castes. Worker drones were distinguished by their inability to fly, since they either were born without wings or were born with non-functional wings. Above the lesser caste was the warrior caste. Mostly composed of winged soldier drones, the warrior caste did most of the fighting in Gene Ocean society and its members began combat training from the moment they hatched. Soldier drones were usually poorly equipped and reliant on swarm tactics, but they were agile and cunning nonetheless. There were two notable subgroups within the warrior caste, the pilot caste and the picador caste. Members of the pilot caste were tasked with piloting Gene Ocean starships, they were wingless, unlike other warriors. The Picador cast, on the other hand, was composed of soldier drones that had proven themselves in combat as skillful fighters and were treated better than other warriors as a result. The highest drone cast in Gene Ocean society was the Aristocrat cast. Aristocrats were much like Gene Ocean soldier drones, but they enjoyed better lives as the other Gene Ocean casts existed to serve their needs. Some aristocrats served as warriors and some were genetically and cybernetically modified to become Geonosian elites, terrifying combatants with beam cannons built into their arms. Most aristocrats, however, were content to live lives of luxury, generally unburdened by responsibility. It's likely the aristocrats were the ones responsible for mating with the Geonosian queens. Each Geonosian hive had one queen, which was constantly birthing more Geonosians at a rate of roughly one egg every eight seconds. The queens were secretive and lived at the bottom of the hives, meaning that very few outsiders ever even heard of them. Each queen was the central link of a hive mind, which connected all the Gene Oceans in a hive telepathically. These hive minds were poorly understood, but particularly great queens had hive minds so strong they were able to control warrior drones even after they had died, with the help of specialized brainworms. Now, the Gene Ocean caste system was pretty nasty in its own right, but the truly horrifying thing about the Gene Oceans was their culture. The Gene Oceans weren't just weaponsmiths, they were bloodthirsty killers by nature, despite the fact they hadn't evolved as predators. 
Their bloodthirst was largely directed against each other, but on rare occasions when outsiders involved themselves with Geonosian affairs, they tended to become the preferred targets of the Geonosians' trademark brutality. In general, the Geonosians absolutely despised anyone they couldn't connect with through their hive minds. This included Geonosians of other hives and outsiders alike, though outsiders were usually hated far more than other Geonosians. In the past, their xenophobia had led them to kill all outsiders on sight, and though they had become much more accepting of non-Geonosians by the time of the Clone Wars, most Geonosians still detested alien species. Very few outsiders ever truly gained respect with Geonosians. Among them was Count Dooku, who gained the respect of the Stalgazian Hive by paying proper homage to Queen Karina the Great. Since Geonosians rarely had contact with outsiders for non-business reasons, their violent xenophobia was largely focused on wars between hives. There were many hives on Geonosis, with some of the most prominent over the years being the Stalgazian, Golbar, Gehenbar, Galad, and Tripper hives. During the Clone Wars, the Stalgazian hive, which was ruled by Queen Karina the Great and Archduke Pogul the Lesser, ruled over all the others, but this hadn't always been the case. Over the millennia, Dominant Geonosian hives arose and fell, and some hives had been destroyed completely by war. Most wars in Geonosis were fought in the tunnels between the hives. Even in peacetime, these catacombs were dangerous places, as they were routinely filled with sonic mines and used by soldier drones to launch raids, sabotage operations, or assassinations in other hives. During wartime, they became vast, claustrophobic kill zones where millions of Geonosians would die fighting each other. To avoid tunnel collapses, the Geonosians relied on sonic weaponry and catacomb warfare, using everything from handheld sonic pistols and rifles to larger sonic cannons against soldiers from other hives. These sonic weapons did little to no damage to the tunnels, but they absolutely annihilated organic beings, liquefying their insides and occasionally pulverizing their bodies altogether. Getting shot by a Geonosian sonic weapon was hands down one of the worst ways to die in the entire Star Wars universe. Pikes and bladed weapons were also favourites of the Geonosians, and they were often modified with vibration cells to inflict as much pain as possible. When Geonosian hives fared poorly in the catacomb wars, their enemies would often raid their hives in force. When Geonosians attacked enemy hives, they were known to bring out more destructive weapons as they generally cared less about preserving infrastructure in enemy territory. Some hives were completely destroyed by proton bombs or other heavy weapons after losing a war, while others were just badly pillaged. Full-scale Geonosian attacks on enemy hives often involved the mass murder of workers and immature Geonosians, sometimes on a genocidal scale. Of course, a war and genocide ultimately aren't really productive activities for a species and so, as the Geonosians advanced, their society shifted away from the catacomb wars and toward gladiatorial combat. According to Geonosian myth, their gods, the gigantic hive overlords, became so angry over the inter-hive conflicts, they fought each other in open combat on the planet's surface, teaching the Geonosians the art of patroniki, or ritual combat, in the process. Ever after, the Geonosians focused their bloodlust on ceremonial executions and arena matches, referred to in Geonosian as the Barahunde. These events were the highlight of the Geonosian year, and even the worker drones could have a grand old time at them. The Geonosian picadors, those who mastered the arts of Patraniki, both managed the various surface arenas and served as gladiators in them. They fought with elaborate, highly deadly weapons, including the picador's spear, the Patraniki scimitar, the caster's net, the confessor's whip, and the beast warden's shield. Sometimes they used mounts, ranging from docile or raised to vicious accolades, and on rare occasions, Patraniki arenas were even flooded to allow for small-scale naval battles. The kind of spectacle featured in the Patraniki arenas varied from event to event. In executions, prisoners would be chained to stone columns and forced to face off against vicious animals. Usually, executions only involved one creature, but occasionally, the aristocrats would call for multiple, which was considered an extremely exciting occurrence by the Geonosians. On very rare occasions, prisoners would manage to survive their encounters with arena beasts. When this happened, the Geonosians believed they had been saved by the gods, and they were granted freedom for their valor and skill. Other arena events involved picadors facing off against animals or each other in gladiatorial matches. 
Battle in the arena was the only way that Geonosians were able to escape the castes they had been born into. Ambitious Geonosians learned the arts of Protraniki and volunteered for combat in the Barahundi. If they proved victorious, they would gain status and in some cases they would be able to ascend to higher castes. Pogul the Lesser, the Archduke of the Stargazian Hive, fought his way to the very top of the Geonosian hierarchy through the arenas, hence his surname. He was born into the lesser caste, battled his way up to the aristocracy, and then overthrew Archduke Haddis the Vaulted to claim his role in the Hive. Pogul's last battle against Haddis was a solid example of just how brutal the Geonosians were as people. After successfully toppling his rival in a rebellion backed by Darth Sidious, Pogul formally challenged Haddis to a battle over the position of Archduke in the Patraniki arena. Haddis had been known to kill his enemies by sentencing them to fight a starved Akle, and so Pogul rode an Akle into the arena against him. After defeating Haddis, Pogul dismounted, tore the Elder Gian Ocean into three pieces, and threw his entrails to the Akle as the crowd cheered. He kept the bones from one of Haddis' legs as a souvenir, turning it into a cane. But that's not all. There was even more to fear from the Gian Oceans than their brutality. Gian Oceans rarely ventured off Geonosis in the years before the Clone Wars, but the Battle of Geonosis caused a bit of an exodus. Large numbers of Gian Oceans left the planet to join the CIS, setting up factory hives to churn out battle droids on planets across the galaxy. On worlds as diverse as the frozen planet Zadja and the rocky wasteland Hypori, they created new fortress hives in a matter of months, building up the droid army in the process. At first, the Gian Oceans settled only on unoccupied worlds, but as the Clone Wars went on, the Confederacy started encouraging them to make use of existing industrial worlds. By the second half of the war, whenever the Confederacy captured a planet that showed promise as a foundry world, they would hand over whole cities to the Gian Oceans, who would turn them into hives. Former residents were usually enslaved and treated as worker drones. Gentes, the Ugnaught homeworld, was the most notable example of this, and the Gian Oceans had begun doing the same to parts of Pau City on Utapau before the Republic invaded. So that's our look at the Gian Oceans, everyone's favorite insectoid species. But what do you think? Would you like us to talk about Geonosis and its inhabitants more in the future? Let us know in the comment section below. And just before you click on those suggested videos guys, make sure you check out our new channel called The Braved where we go through all different eras to find the most badass individuals of these eras and transform it into epic video form. So that's the first link in the description. And if you're more keen on music, we have our Relax Jack music channel, where we take music from that channel and use it in a lot of the videos you listen to here. And if you want access to a behind the scenes discord where you can chat to myself and the team who make these videos, as well as some exclusive content, then do consider donating to our Patreon. And if you just want to join our wider community, make sure you check us out on our main Geetsleys Discord and our currently under construction Geetsleys Gaming Network, which is going to be coming back better than ever. Anyways, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.